This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Starting a new project is a moment filled with excitement, anticipation, and a little bit of trepidation. For every single painting in the racks in my studio has a problem. In fact, that's why it's at my studio, because there is something that needs to be addressed. And sometimes those problems are very minor, easily resolved, quick and simple. Sometimes they're not, and they take a tremendous amount of work to address. And sometimes they're neither here nor there, in that they may look complicated, or they may look very simple. But only when we start really examining the piece, and sometimes not even until we are elbows deep in the piece, do we truly know the scope of what we have to deal with. This oval painting of a monk with a crucifix is no exception. It is old, that is quite obvious, and any painting of age is generally going to have issues. This is because poor handling, poor care, and the myriad attempts to address the problems, all well-intentioned but ill-advised. And this painting falls squarely into that camp. Upon first glance, we can see that there is tons of discolored yellow natural resin varnish, probably multiple layers of it. In addition, we can see that there is old grime still trapped in the impasto, the texture of the painting that was never removed in the first place. There is also a lot of retouching and some signs of significant structural damage. Looking at the painting, a lot of this is evident. Spend enough time looking at any painting, and you can start to spot the problems right off the bat. But visible light and the naked eye only tell half the story. For the other half, we turn to ultraviolet light, as this spectrum of light allows us to see things we can't with our eyes. It allows us to see old varnish, old retouching, old adhesives. It's a decoder of past work. And this painting does not disappoint. It is a storied example of old work. There is just about everything you can imagine on this painting. And now the picture is starting to come into focus. Now reading a blacklight is more craft than science, but I'll give it a shot here. The areas in red that I'm circling are retouching that is on top of all of the old varnish. It fluoresces very strong. The areas in purple, they fluoresce, but less so, and so I presume that they are underneath the varnish. You can see just how much retouching there is, and I'm not actually circling all of the areas of retouching, just the really big obvious ones that come across upon first glance. You can see just how much of the painting was just simply overpainted. Nothing we like to see, but nothing that is uncommon. Now the areas of green are a little bit in more interesting. These look like areas of new varnish that's been added atop everything. You can see the drips and the brushwork indicating that this was applied with a brush. I don't know why that this was applied unevenly and poorly. I have some theories, but it doesn't really matter. <laughs> but looking at all of this, a history of old and really not great work, all of this we're going to have to contend with, well, it leads me to look at this painting and simply say, oh brother. So here is our painting, in all of its round resplendent glory. And the roundness does add a wrinkle to this painting's conservation. It is certainly more difficult to deal with a round painting than a square painting. Because of course, square things are easy. You know, like square space. Oh come on, did you really think I was going to let that one go? But the truth remains, dealing with Squarespace is easy. They have taken all of the complexity out of designing and launching and maintaining your own website. And whether that website is for your business, your personal hobby, your artwork, or just because you want to have a little piece of the internet that is yours, Squarespace makes it easy. And we're not talking about something basic here, we're talking about a fully-fledged platform that will grow with you as your needs change. 
You never thought you needed an e-commerce solution, but now you do. Well, click of a button and you have one. You never imagined having to schedule appointments online through your website. Well, Squarespace has a plugin for that too including a new suite of tools for content creators so that they can manage all of their content in one place, their own website. So head over to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash baumgartner to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. With every painting, the first step is always looking. But after we've looked and examined the painting, done a myriad of tests, understood the complexities that the painting presents, and assembled that into a conservation proposal, well, then we can actually get going, at least once the client has approved the scope of work. In this case, that has come to pass, and now we can get into the work. For me, that begins by disassembling the painting removing it from its support. And in this case, what I'm finding is rusted ring shank nails, the bane of any conservator's existence. These are not meant for paintings. They are incredibly difficult to remove. The ring shanks hold on to the wood, and if the nails rust, it's even harder to get them out. But get them out I will, that's my job, and using a little bit of elbow grease and a lot of tenacity and a few choice placed words, I will get all of these tacks out and then eventually move on to separating the canvas from the support. Always being careful to make sure that I didn't miss any tacks or that anything else is holding on. But once I have freed it, I can separate these two pieces and move on to the next step. As with so many paintings, the next thing that is critically important is a facing. We are going to be removing this canvas from its lining, and before we do that, we want to take some precautionary measures to make sure that all of the paint stays where it is in the event that there is flexing of the canvas or that the painting is just unstable. We don't know what we don't know, so we move cautiously and take precautionary actions. By adhering this Kozo Washi Japanese mulberry paper, which is incredibly strong, with a fish gelatin glue, it will conform to the surface of the painting, melding around the impasto and the texture of the paint. And then when it dries, it will become rigid and firm and hold everything in place. There are other ways of stabilizing a paint layer, but this is a very tried and true method, and it will pay dividends later on. Once that facing has dried, I can begin the process of removing this old lining. Now, we are removing this old lining because we need to access the original canvas to deal with some of the structural problems. There are distortions in this canvas that just can't be flattened or addressed without taking this lining off. In addition, if we were to clean this canvas, we would inevitably discover that there are areas of damage structurally that were repaired that need to be undone and re-repaired in a more sensitive, modern way. And none of that is possible if this lining canvas is still on the painting. So it has to come off. Sometimes removing a lining canvas is relatively easy. You can grab a corner and just peel and it comes off in one fell swoop and you ride off into the sunset <laughs> and have a great day. Other times, as in this case, it fights you. This canvas is incredibly brittle and deteriorated. It is an open weave canvas, as you can see here. It's not tightly woven, and so it just doesn't have the structural fidelity that we would like to see when doing a lining. This plus the strength of the rabbit skin glue bond and the age of the canvas has all coupled to make it incredibly brittle. And that means that when I peel it back, I am lucky if I get a big piece like this. More often than not, it is very small pieces. And as you can see, it takes a long time to remove canvas. Piece by piece, using the scalpel where necessary, I will peel it up and peel it off. But eventually, after a couple of days of working, I get all of that canvas off. Well, almost all of that canvas. There are some areas, particularly where the canvas was covered by the stretcher, that it is so oxidized and so deteriorated that I just can't peel it off. It just crumbles. So I'm going to remove it wet. Certainly I could have used this procedure on the entire canvas and peeled it up much easier, but I don't want to add moisture unless it's a last resort because moisture causes canvas to swell 
and it causes canvas to distort. And while the swelling of the canvas and the rabbit skin glue is good and necessary to a degree to remove all of this material, if I can remove it dry, it's a much safer procedure and it results in less trauma for the painting. So that's my preferred method. Unfortunately, in some cases, like in this area of canvas that was covered by the stretcher, I couldn't remove it dry. So turning to the laponite, which is a synthetic clay that can hold three or four times its volume of water, it effectively turns water into a gel. I can paint it on and then let it sit for a couple of minutes. It may take one minute, may take five, it may take 15 for that rabbit skin glue to absorb the moisture and become soft again. But once it does, you can see I can peel back this canvas relatively easy. It's still not a one fell swoop type of action, but it does come off. And so I will continue this process along all four sides where the canvas was covered by the stretcher and too oxidized and brittle to remove dry and peel back all of this canvas. Even still, it is pretty slow going, but it is going. Now, to remove the glue, I can come back with the laponite, paint on a section, and let it sit for a couple of minutes. Once it's reached a point where the rabbit skin glue is saturated and soft, I will paint on an adjoining square and let that sit. I kind of want to move one step ahead of myself so that while I'm scraping off the glue on this first square, the glue on the second square is softening up. When I go to scrape the glue on the second square, I will paint a third square on, and so on and so forth. That way I'm not waiting around, except after the first application of laponite. Using an incredibly dull and old scalpel, I don't want a sharp blade, I just want a blunt edge, I will glide along the surface and scrape off all of that rabbit skin glue. Once I have removed it with the scalpel, I will come back with an enzyme cleaner and saturate a couple of cotton balls and rub the surface and pick up all of the remaining glue that didn't come off with the scalpel. And you can see the canvas looks pretty good. All of that adhesive is coming off and I'll continue to remove this adhesive until the cotton balls are pretty much clean, changing when necessary and checking often to make sure that there is no adhesive still coming up. It takes multiple passes, but eventually I get the canvas to a state of cleanliness that I'm satisfied with. And then I can come back and use a couple of sheets of cotton blotter paper. This is just compressed cotton rag paper and some weights to press it. Because remember, we introduced moisture, which will cause this canvas to distort if we don't dry it under weights. Scraping glue off of a canvas is not my favorite thing, but it is a meditative process. And once you get into a rhythm, it goes pretty quickly. You start to isolate the movement from your hand into your wrist, into your elbow, and into your shoulder, sometimes even into your torso and through your legs. And that makes repeating the action of scraping much easier. And over the course of several days, there's no way to do this in one sitting. You just lose your mind and your focus. And when you lose your focus, that's when bad things can happen. So over the course of several days, the majority of the glue is removed and we are left with the last square. You'll notice that I have changed the position of the scalpel. I have switched how I'm scraping it. That's partially because I found that it is more effective on this section and also to give my hand and elbow a rest. And with the application of these weights, the glue is all removed. Even though I pressed the canvas as I was removing the rabbit skin glue adhesive, it is still slightly distorted. There are waves, there are undulations, some of them from the canvas being old, some from the process of removing the adhesive. And this is where the hot table comes in handy. By exposing the painting to moisture, heat, and pressure, I can further relax that canvas and I can set it into a new state. So when it is moist and hot, it is pliable. Then when I turn the heat off and I expose the painting to pressure and cool it and dry it on a new piece of cotton blotter paper, well, it will be in a nice flat and smooth state, which is what we want. The hot table allows me to extract the air 
through this envelope and to apply heat. I can adjust the pressure accordingly, and then I just let the painting sit. It can take anywhere from one to four hours to execute this process. I'll check it often, but mostly it's passive, and I just let the table work. After letting my favorite employee do their work, the hot table, of course, that's who I'm talking about, I can come back and check to make sure it's cool, and if it is, I can turn the pressure off and remove the painting from this mylar envelope. Now the painting still has some residual moisture, even though a lot of it has been transferred to this cotton blotter paper, so I need to press the painting because I just flattened it and I don't want it to start to distort again. If I don't press it, it will distort, and I'll be back to square one. So I can remove the blotter paper, flip it over, and place it on a sheet of drywall or gypsum board or sheetrock. And then I can place the canvas on that, and then cover it with some felt to evenly distribute the pressure and to protect the surface of the painting. Once it's covered and in position, I can lower a second sheet of sheetrock and apply some weight. And this will allow me to keep the painting flat while it dries and acclimates to my studio. I want all of that residual moisture to go anywhere but into the canvas. So into the blotter paper, the felt, and then into the sheetrock is precisely what I want. After a few days under weights and allowing all of that residual moisture to dissipate and the canvas to become fully dry, I can remove the boards, remove the felt, and check on the painting. And if I've done my job correctly, and in this case I have, the painting is smooth. All of the planar distortions that were so problematic beforehand are gone. The waves, the ripples, and the creases have been eliminated. And that's precisely what we were working for. Thus far, we've done a lot of work, but it's all been behind the scenes and preparatory. Structural work that's important, but really, now we can start turning our attention to the really exciting part of this process, the cleaning. But there's a little bit of work to be done before we get to cleaning this painting. Sometimes I will leave the facing on a painting until really the last step of cleaning, but in this case, I'm gonna take it off now because I need access to the front of the painting to do a canvas inlay where the hole was, and that's just not possible with the facing in place. To remove the facing, it's very simple. A little bit of warm water will penetrate through the paper to the adhesive, swell it and soften it, and then I can peel the paper up. Unlike the lining canvas, this does come off relatively easy. There are some areas where it will get stuck to the old varnish. That's just a byproduct of the heat and pressure that was used on the hot table treatment. But ultimately, all of this is coming off anyways, and so a little bit of paper fuzz that's stuck in the varnish isn't really that big of an impediment. Oftentimes, the paper will lift off a heavy layer of surface grime, but in this case, it's not taking much, indicating to me that the painting is relatively clean and we don't have to do an ancillary treatment to remove a heavy layer of soot or grime before we tackle the varnish removal. You may notice that the varnish has taken on a milky or opaque appearance, and that's called a bloom. Oftentimes when natural resin varnish comes into contact with moisture, either directly or through high humidity, it becomes cloudy or milky and deteriorates. This really isn't a problem for us because we're removing all of this old varnish. For this varnish removal, I am going to be using free solvents. There are any number of ways that we can remove varnish. Free solvent mixtures, gelled solvents, resin soaps, enzymes, even mechanically. And deciding on the right approach is really up to the conservator based on the painting. We have to test the varnish and determine its composition, its oxidation level, how easily it is removed, what stability the paint layer has, and how much handling or solvent exposure it can tolerate, and combine all of those and then decide on a path. And no two paintings are alike. Even paintings by the same artist with the same materials may react differently to the same treatments. So it isn't as simple as mixing up a big jug of magic varnish remover <laughs> and just applying it to a painting. I wish it were. It would make my life and every conservator's life much, much easier. But we really must tailor our approach to this particular painting. And even in a painting, we may need to take multi 
multifaceted approaches. Some areas of the painting, some colors, may be more fugitive or more vulnerable to solvent mixtures than others, and so we may need to temper that solution or change the solution altogether. Really, there is no easy way of doing this, and it takes a lot of experience and a lot of patience and practice, a lot of testing, and a lot of just being able to listen to the painting and do what it will allow. I have left the cleaning of the face for last because it is obviously one of the most important areas. It's also one of the most damaged areas, and frankly, it's just one of the more exciting areas, and I like to leave the exciting things for last because it gives me something to look forward to. As I remove the varnish, I can start to see some more of the colors, more of the brushwork. But what I can also see is a lot of old retouching coming off. Now, luckily for us, the retouching was executed on top of a layer of old varnish that was never removed. Not necessarily good work, but it's beneficial to us because it means that this old oil paint retouching can be lifted off. If it was directly on the paint layer, it would be much more difficult, maybe impossible. Removing all of this old varnish and old overpainting, we can start to see the scope of the damage and how much of this painting was repainted or glazed in. And this is not uncommon, it's not even expected. I kind of saw this when I was looking at the painting under blacklight, but it's still shocking. Because with all of this varnish removed and the application of a little bit of wetting solvent just so that I can see what the painting looks like, well, there's not much to say aside from, oh brother. You can see that there was a massive tear in the face. And with that tear, there was extreme paint loss. In fact, almost the entire eye, cheek, and part of the mouth is missing. And all of that, coupled with the skinning, the removal of paint, and the paint losses throughout the face and the rest of the painting, I'm going to have some work cut out for me. On top of all of that, the painting was never properly cleaned during the last conservation attempt. And so there's a lot of grime still stuck on the painting. So I'm taking a neutral organic soap, I'm going to apply it with a bristle brush and then just agitate the surface of the painting. Once it's been given enough time, I can come back with a cotton ball and lift off all of that grime. And you can see just how much is coming off of the painting. It's kind of remarkable and also kind of ridiculous that the painting was never properly cleaned, but it means that we're going to get to see it in a really beautiful state. One of the reasons the painting came to my studio was that there was flaking of the old work, particularly in this area where the hole was, where the tear was above the eye. In the past, the solution was simply to put a whole bunch of chalk-based fill-in medium and oil paint on it and just cover it up. But of course, that failed. Without a substrate to bond to, that fill-in medium is going to crack and lift off. And I need all of this gone so that I can do a proper method of repair. So I'm chipping away at all of that stuff with my scalpel, and once I get it all removed, I can start thinking about how I'm going to repair this hole. And I've chosen to do what is called an inlay. I've selected a canvas from my batch of old canvas stock, and this is just canvas that I've salvaged from other projects over the years, and I'm going to lay it underneath the painting. And then I'll come in with a pen and I will start tracing this opening. And yes, I have explored using high resolution photography, vector mapping, and plotters and cutters to do this work. But you see, the thing is, the amount of time it would take, not to mention the expense of setting it up, it doesn't make it any better or faster than me doing it by hand. Technology can be an amazing tool if wielded properly, but sometimes it's just a distracting siren, and doing it the old-fashioned way is perfectly fine, as you can see. Once this is cut out, I will lay it in place, and then I will take some reversible conservation adhesive, I will cover the inlay with the adhesive, and the edges of the original canvas. And then I will lay a piece of Kozo Washi on top and blend it in, feather it in with a little bit more adhesive. This is not the permanent structural repair, but this will hold it in place until I do the full repair. This needs to be pressed over a couple of days to dry. And then next time we can start thinking about how to put this painting back together.
So far, we've done a lot of disassembly, taking things off of the painting and a little bit of putting things back. But the real work of making this painting whole again, well, that's coming up next time.